Hello, everybody. This is like Zoom camera off mode. Intimidating. All right. So thank you for this time. I have 17 minutes and 56 seconds with you. Let's go. So it's going to be fast. It'll be, it'll be over in, in, in a second. Here it goes. Ready? OK, this is the Resilience Tech Report Preview, formerly called the CX Report, and I'll explain why. Um, what it is, is it's an attempt it's an attempt to kind of like think of what's actually fundamentally important, which is safety. And it turns out being safe isn't really easy, but if you understand risk, it gets a little easier. The other thing is if you understand the galaxy, it gets really interesting. So we're going to go there. And lastly, it's all about digital transformation, these two buzzwords together. If we understand that differently, we take advantage. Ready? Here we go. Okay, first of all, just remembering things, those of you who know me, I grew up in this tofu store in Seattle. It was very cold, and we worked in the morning from 2 a.m. to 6 p.m. at night. It was very hot in the summer and very cold in the winter. And this world shaped me because uh, my father ran into the supermarket, and he tripped, and he fell, and he broke his arm. So for six months, my father, the main machine who made the tofu, was broken. So all of us kids had to do everything my dad could do. It was the worst year ever. But when we think about that, we don't like bad things to happen. But oftentimes, hard work creates beautiful things. The goal isn't to fall down. The goal in this sense was to make the best tofu in the world. Now, when we think about simplicity, which I just began to study years later when I was at MIT, I realized that the world is much more complex than we ever want it to be. And so I desired to find simplicity, but I could never find it. And one day I was at one of these events, and there was an older gentleman who sat down and said to me, John, the world's always been falling apart, so relax. From that moment, I began thinking about how do we balance complexity and simplicity? How do we relax? It's not easy. So let me help you relax. Um, there's three simple facts you have to know about the universe, and it gets a lot better. First fact, the Earth revolves around the sun. Thank you, exactly. This you cannot change. No, you can't. Furthermore, the Earth is, is off its axis and rotates. And that changes the seasons, not the distance, the seasons. So why do we care about the, the glaciers melting? It makes the Earth unbalanced. And so it'll move the axis, which will change the seasons for many parts of the world. An issue. The second thing is that the moon, let's go again, revolves around the Earth. What does the moon do? The moon gravitates the water, moves it around. Like a, like a jello system. And so the moon moves the water, changes the tides. It's mixing our Earth in real time. The last important fact to know about is the fact that at the very center of the Earth, it is very hot. Um, it is super hot. It's so hot that the heat comes out to the surface, creating earthquakes and also volcanoes. And let's not forget, the Earth is speeding at 1,000 miles per hour as well. So we're on a spaceship. So when we understand these three factors, you don't have to worry. You can't really change that right now. Are we calmer now? It made me calmer. Now, all that into consideration, I've been in the design space trying to understand how design, technology, and business come together. I have many reports. Uh, the first report in 2015 talked about the interaction of startups and venture capital. And this is in 2015, back when different startups in Silicon Valley were taking off, combining technology with design. Not just like Apple, but in a new way. User experience was being invented as a field in Silicon Valley. And so in 2015, that was my focus, to understand it in more depth. And all these reports are online, and also you can find them on YouTube. The main conclusion is that the technology industry today mirrors the automotive industry. They're very related, because in the same way that the car industry, once it matured, used design to differentiate, technology is just the same, high-tech today. So I have uh, eight reports. 
Uh, they cover all kinds of things. In 2016, I framed what kinds of design there are. There are just three kinds of design, classical design, design thinking, and computational design. And after this, I began wondering about computational design and realized in 2017 it was going to create an excluding world. So AI that can hurt people is something I began writing about. And inclusive design began to emerge. 2018 was about China and its amazing prowess in mobile-based design. Why is China so good at mobile-based design? It's because it experienced the pandemic in the early 2000s. And so there was isolation. So mobile commerce, e-commerce, emerged in China 10 years prior. And that is why we're learning from the Chinese how to work in the post-pandemic era. On top of that, I heard of this thing called remote work. Remote work, what is it? And so I joined, at the time, the largest all-distributed tech company to learn about it. At the time, there were only roughly 500 companies that worked all remote. By 2019, I began looking at how computation had changed everything for the better and for the worse. And what I found in the end is that the question became one of trust and this question of how there can be more equality. And this is going to be a common problem, which we see today. In 2020, I focused on digital transformation. And digital transformation in particular, breaking it apart as a combination of marketing technology and product technology, and how companies are not designed to build digital products at scale the way a startup is. In 2021, I introduced the safety stack. And the safety stack was all about how the black swans had to come, and suddenly we want safety more than beauty. Beauty is a new kind of safety. And from this, I've been thinking about accidents, bad things, and I joined Everbridge to look at the state of the world in physical and digital disasters. And I wrote a book called How to Speak Machine to help explain more people how technology works because most people don't have a computer science background, so it's a mystical thing. So I launched all those things, and years later, I realized it's about the difference between two words. There's a the word fear. The word fear is something we don't feel good about. But the power of design is that design can change form and content immediately by just changing the typeface. So this is fear set in Roboto, but now this is fear in the pirate face. Ah, it sounds, it doesn't look so scary anymore. Fear, ah, I'm not afraid. Or fear, this is the nightclub fear. It's so popular, let's go to fear. Oh my gosh, great drinks. And so just with the form, the content hasn't changed. Design is able to do that, it's quite magical. Let's do the same thing with the word uncertainty, which is something we are afraid of in general. Uncertainty, you can make into like a, a bubblegum. Uncertainty, you know, it makes great bubbles. Or we can have uncertainty, kind of like a makeup line. And so the way that design can change form, content, the relationship is quite unique because if you just remove all of this form and you focus on content, you see how powerful content really is. If I remove the un and uncertainty, it feels really good. If I move the letters of fear around and make it the word free, it's so much better. So in many cases, content is much more powerful than form. And so when we think about that, the content of today of uncertainty, there's a simple way to understand it as words. There's a word, word called hazard. Hazard means something that could happen to you. It is not the same as disaster. A hazard just happens. A disaster happens to something that you care about, like your pet, or something you care about, or yourself, your own body. And disasters are different. Disasters that impact you, they sometimes can make you die. We don't like that as humans, right? It's terrible. So disaster that impacts your life or someone else's life is terrible. Hazard happens, disaster happens to something you care about. But lastly, there are some people who are impacted and die, and then there are some who survive. So a disaster, another impact, is how survivors react. And so there's a whole science of how we humans deal with uncertainty, disaster, and grief that I find fascinating and important because it can make you less 
uncertain and feel a little more free. So when I think about the pandemic and we all think about it wearing our masks, I've been trying to put it in context. So this is the global deaths from natural disasters. Do you see the spike here? The spike is, of course, this current pandemic, number of deaths. However, if you look further back in time, there have been incidents with the same number of deaths. It's just we forget it. When we think of the Spanish influenza, it was 50 million deaths compared to roughly 3 to 9 million for COVID right now. So we humans forget tragedy to continue to evolve. And that's a powerful thing. We are resilient because we're trained to keep going on and giving that to our children. So this is Benjamin Franklin, someone famous in the United States. He once said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes. And so this is in 1700. So I think it's a great piece of wisdom that applies today. OK, now we're going into how we die is not from disasters. Our own body dies by itself. Uh, the number one reason why we die is the cardiovascular situation. This is the statistics in uh, Portugal. Um, different countries, people die differently of natural causes. Uh, you see the pink that applies to drug use in the United States. Uh, more pink in the world, different ways to die around the world. But just remember, the disasters in general are not the main cause of death. It's our own body somehow fails. That is very hard to fix, but of course, exercise is good for you, so remember that. OK, now I want to do something together with all of you. It's interactive, OK? This is my favorite list of people's regrets when they are dying. So I'm going to have us read it all together one by one. So I'm going to go like this, and we read it, OK? Follow me? I'm going to go like this and read it, OK? All right, here it goes. One, two, three, read it. OK, good. Thank you. That, somebody did that already. Next one. Ready, set, go. OK, good. Next one. Ready, set, go. Feel it, huh? Ready, set, go. Last one, go. I hope you feel that. I mean, it's really powerful. These are like, when you read them, you're like, yeah, I wish I did. So I hope some of you wish differently today. Let's keep going. All right. So I, in, in 2006, I made something called Life Countdown, where you input your age, and it tells you how many springs you have left on the average with flowers. There are dead flowers and living flowers. I recently went back and checked it, and many of my seasons have died. <laughs> so again, perspective. How much what you have left in your life, how do you invest in it, is a topic I've been fascinated about um, because I began in this space of simplicity, but I'm much more interested in complexity because the world is so complex. It's why we need to find resilience. And resilience is actually achievable. And so a lot of my work today uh, is this space of enterprise resilience. I'm at a company that actually created the best in enterprise resilience program. So it's kind of my thing right now. It's understand it. So please follow along on that journey. Let's talk about um, pandemic. So the cover of Harvard Business Review in 2006 was not about the pandemic, but the entire issue was about the pandemic. It's fascinating. If you read the cover article, it reads, should a pandemic emerge, it would become the single greatest threat to business continuity and could remain so for up to 18 months. This is in 2006. There's more material in this old issue of HBR. I bought it on eBay. It's fascinating. But note, it wasn't the cover. The cover wasn't about the pandemic. And the reality is that it's because it didn't seem to impact the life cycle of a business. But it turns out that businesses, uh, on the right-hand side, you see here, this is the average lifespan of an S&P 500 company. Companies used to live a lot longer, and over time, they live shorter lives. And so for companies to live a longer life, which is important for shareholders, we want to ask how businesses die. How do they fail? So if you want to look in the place of uh, supply chain logistics, a perfect example of supply chain logistics, uh, people culture, this is a place why businesses actually die. 
and the risks that they face. And so this is a topic that I'm focused on in discovering enterprise resilience with a lot of companies at Everbridge now. The other exciting thing is the fact that there are complete digital analogs of everything in the supply chain. There is a digital supply chain as well. Again, most people don't understand the digital supply chain, but a great space of opportunity. OK, so let's talk about the supply chain. Why are supply chains breaking? Why do they break? On the left-hand side, you have the result of lean manufacturing, global logistics that are ultra-efficient. If one thing fails, everything breaks. On the right, you have a more resilient supply chain. It's actually much more expensive. It does things like hold inventory, which every factory says, no, we can't hold inventory. Or it has redundant suppliers. No, that costs too much. But redundancy is resilience. It's costly. So we're in a new era where we'll see more investments in resilience. It will cost more to be resilient, but it makes sense if we understand the uncertainties of the world. OK. The word resilience, super interesting. Uh, I spent the whole afternoon on the weekend a couple of weeks ago to figure this out. Resilience is a hard word to understand because, like every word, like design, it means too many things. And so there's two ways to understand resilience, and this is done by linguists. One way is resilience means bouncing back, bouncing back. The other meaning is bouncing back and transforming, being stronger. These are two different meanings. Let me break them down. So I found, I had, I, I had to find this. So in the, late, in, the, in, the, in the early 1600s, the first reference to resilience is in an encyclopedia of physics. It described when you drop a ball, it bounces back. And that's resilience in the 1600s. But later, in the 1800s, it was used to describe Scotland. Scotland is a hardy country. It's fighting back. It's transforming. It's resilient. It became a way to describe something that is much more different than just bouncing back. It describes bouncing back and transforming, being stronger. OK. So last point. There's a thing called a black swan by Nassim Taleb. It's poorly understood because there are good black swans and bad black swans. A good black swan was the World Wide Web. Nobody expected that. That's a good black swan. And there are also more difficult black swans, like the COVID-19 black swan. Bad black swans, good black swans. Being ready for good black swans and black swans is advantageous in business. Lastly, understanding computation is so difficult because there's a new giant blue swan of digital transformation. And how do we respond to that? By knowing what computation is all about. OK, ending on time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Done. Let me take a picture of this over here. Real people. All right. Thank you. Bye.